Now is Gano, everybody. I hope um, I just first like to express my thank you to inviting me back again and to this wonderful group of people and even more people. I've had a wonderful time here and it's just been a lovely, a lovely, lovely day. This is a new talk, so I'll preface it by that. Um, it's actually a chapter in my next work on unsettling visual terrains. So I'm giving it a whirl here. So this paper will explore the iconography related to treaties, citizenship and territoriality and contemporary art practices in the context of 100 years of the Indian Citizen Act to land back. I will be honest, I didn't quite get to land back because we have 20 minutes. Watch. <laughs> so many of the artworks, but we can talk about that in Q and A. Many of the artworks I will talk about today were part of the Thinking in Indian exhibit at the University of Buffalo in 2022. I was fortunate enough to work and think with many of the art pieces, along with Jolene Rickard, Teresa McCarthy, who's on Indaga, um, and also Margaret Jacobs, who did um, the curation for us as well. And thinking through the relationship of unsettling the visual terrains of settler colonialism, I was inspired by John Mohawk and in particular Jolene, who encourages us to think of indigenous artists, artists needs artists as to be understood through the clarifying lens of sovereignty and self-determination, not just in terms of assimilation, colonization, and identity politics. So that is something that Jolene, if any of you have ever met her, is a powerhouse in making us think through those concepts in such a way. Um, in our program, we wrote the following about the exhibit, which represented over 50 artists from across Haudenosaunee territories, accounting for all our six nations and the different nations within nations that exist there, and artists. Quote, at a time when the field of Native American Indigenous studies and Indigenous activism has blossomed, we look back and forward to the seeding of intellectual traditions, seizing of territorial imaginings through meaningful actions, and the threading of our grounded relationality as we come together with a good mind. And as we begin this conference, I would like us to think that and come together with that good mind and with that meaning, that idea of meaningful action that we need to have in that backward and forward thinking. So I hope to do this today as we talk about the complexity of citizenship, settler power, and the afterlife of the Indian Citizenship Act. The Indian Citizenship, the Indian Citizenship Act, there's got to be a better way to say this, the ICA. I'll help, I'll help shave off some minutes for the rest of your talks. The ICA itself, centers on the human and the closing of the co-constitutive power of the U.S., Canada, and I will also say Mexico, territorial sovereignty. The act domesticates Indians as citizens under the shroud of American legal territorial sovereignty, moving indigenous lands to the purview of the Secretary of Interior in the U.S. and under the Indian Act in Canada. In contrast to this moment, artists have long depicted an alternative vision of the relationship between belonging and land that exceeds settler borders and their colonial premises. We opened our particular exhibit with Shelley Nero's Indian Brains, a lesser known piece from acclaimed Mohawk filmmaker and photographer. Um, she's best known for her photography in many ways, but she does fabulous film work too. And she has a new film out, I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. The large disembodied head loomed, it went from floor to ceiling, about as tall as those windows there, um, loomed to the, to the right of the gallery across from the wording, um, some of the wording that I just read you, evoking a presence through a tongue-in-cheek, left brain, the left-right brain dichotomy that elicited a critique of reason or the left brain versus art, creativity on the right brain. In Nero's version, the brain is a connection between land and the stars, between the constellations and the right network to the universe and the left down to the earth. It is neither disconnected to emotion or logic, but in a good mind brings those together. But in Indian brain, it is an Indian brain that looks towards connection and relationship. Furthermore, the Indian brain resembles the flying heads and stories from our ancestors, 
a point here I'd like to thank Audra for making in regards to the paintings. So this is very much a, a, a new concept here. The flying heads, well, for, it, in relation to this, Nero. Um, the flying heads in Northeastern indigenous stories stem from a conflict that did not go away with the sheer force after the heads of enemies were cut off in a river with the Wyandotte in Quran. This is an old, old story. Um, can you please turn to the next one? Thank you. Um, using the flying heads as a meta metaphorical hermeneutics, Allard Tremblay and Elaine Coburn state in their, their, their looking at um, political science and flying heads, she says, flying head ideologies of settler colonialism cannot be defeated by reasoned argument alone, but only in turning away from the colonial state relations that necessitate and sustain them in a turning toward the resurgence of diverse indigenous political thoughts that structure alternative uh, political practices. So we see here the use of this iconography of a flying head uh, coming through. I highly suggest if you want to hear great stories about the flying head um, on YouTube, uh, John Fiona Spadden uh, has many, and he also writes in Indian Time. He has several flying head stories. The one depicted here, we see the flying head being chased um, after the woman who runs into the bark house. He's used to seeing people run into the woods, right? And this has a lot of metaphors that we can talk about in q and It gets really deep. Um, edge of the woods, etc. So she running into the woods is where they normally run. Rather than that, the mother runs into the bark house, right? And in doing so, she throws a, a stone up at the at the creature. She pretends to eat it. She throws it on the ground. He tries to eat it. He burns himself and he goes away and realizes that woman must be very tough. <laughs> you can't mess with mothers. <laughs> So in thinking about the flying head that we saw with Shelley Nero, we can also think about what this means in one of these stories about the future of next generations. And when we talk about citizenship, we're not just talking uh, uh, about a political identity. We're talking about intergenerations as well and what that means in the context. And that's what our artists are relating here. So citizenship becomes a hot point of turning away from settler structures and focusing on the enactment seizing and seeding, and here I'm using um, seeding from Sky Woman falling through the ground, seizing territory, just because I like that idea. I guess I did get to land back. So <laughs> seizing territory um, and threading. And here I think of how Kaji Cook talks about threading through birthing the next generations as well. That's where that, that aspect came from in our exhibit. Um, threading to that next generations. So like the flying heads, the Indian brain keeps returning, and it often does so through our experience viewing art that creates an alternative spaces of belonging for those who may not live or embody the concept of citizens of their nation, nor accept the citizenship of the settler state, though they often must live by the dictates of settler power. So the, the reconfiguration, next one, of forms of territorial sovereignty through our practices that rethink land and relationships are not only between landed points, but also in relation to other humans and more than humans. What might we gain from examining public art in other built environments where the subtlety of assertion of treaty rights existing long before the 1924 Act is not so apparent to an American public, but is the iconography that creates a sense of belonging from those in reciprocal relationships with indigenous nations. And here I think, for instance, when I'm walking in Buffalo, when you see the Haudenosaunee flag and you're like, oh yeah, somebody lives there, right? There's a sense of belonging in that reclaiming of land that enacts itself in those everyday moments. So another question that I had was how does expressive citizenship creatively refuse 100 years of US and Canadian, uh, Canadian citizenship and thus disrupt the colonial geographies based on property logics? While I do not answer all these questions today, I do hope to at least provoke the discussion of peeking over the fence in the words of Helena Maria Veramontis so that we can imagine new futures. Born to Onondaga, and Tuscarora parents, Jay Carrier's work seen here on the title page ask us to consider citizenship and belonging. Carrier's work, often mixed media and composed of found objects in place, reflect, that's, reflect those kind of threading 
between generations that I spoke to. The frame of the painting that you see here um, simultaneously situates the salmon as a relative or a citizen of the falls that predates the borders of US and Canada. They don't have a born Indian end date or a citizenship date, right, salmon? So Niagara Falls is not only the site of the first binational treaty between co-constitutive settler states, it is also a famed border crossing site with a Canadian side, often deemed the prettier side, and a US side, just like our politics. Canada is too often deemed the prettier side. Thank God for Audra here and the other Haudenosaunee scholars to make sure that's clear. Our Anishinaabe too, yeah, gotta get the Anishinaabe in there. Um, so the peace, friendship, and rainbow bridges all carry a significant traffic from all over the world and create a narrative of a friendly, diplomatic, democratic, civilized uh, nations back and forth between, between them and, and the way that these, this border comes to be, right? This place was significant, has significant Haudenosaunee territories, however, and is now known as a mutual rec that unfortunately is now known as a mutual recognition of the settler state of determining those who enter and leave the respectively claimed and now propertied land at that place. Carrier's work asserts a refusal, here in the words of Simpson, and it is a non-acceptance of the, quote, the dispossession of your lands, of internalizing the things that have been taught about you to you. And we see this in, in this particular photo where he's playing, um, or this particular photo of uh, this painting, where he's playing with, you know, the things that aren't taught. Salmon have no citizenship, right? Salmon travel freely back and forth across that border. In a geographic sense, citizenship is only given meaning in its spatialized form. To act as a citizen is to act in place. In settler citizenship, it is to act in a place that is not yours and insert power over others you extract or eradicate through varying the level of degree of citizenship and normalizing settler promise, prominences as the natural citizens. As geographers have noted, citizenship then becomes action in the, quote, background of life, subtle and unremarkable until it is disturbed. This gets into some of the other work I've done is that Indians are the graffiti and they remain that which, which calls something out of place in Avery Gordon's sense of a haunting, right? We're a haunting, powerful ghosts here. So settler citizenship status as a primary source of power is questioned in Carrier's piece, bringing us into relation with the more than human, the salmon, and references to condoled chiefs in the sidebar that outline the cane, the cane sticks that outline the salmon who breaks out of the border of the picture. And you see that down in the bottom with the tail and the bleeding in there as well. There is an elsewhere to the glitz and glam of Marilyn Monroe, tightrope dancing Tesla and Edison and the fabricated, fabricated myths of dying Indian maidens, which I also address elsewhere, as Carrier posits a different aesthetic affiliation with the falls. In his rendition, the salmon maintains belonging regardless of the border and sits in relation to the Confederacy. In other words, he's not doing this decolonization by planting a garden or having an animal. It's still in relation to political governance of indigenous people. Oftentimes, I think this is a, a misthought um, among, among many, I'll just say that. He cheekily titles this piece, Salmon Jumps the Niagara, referencing the colloquial language of jumping the border that we find all too often in, in those shenanigans <laughs> we have in the U.S. Legislating criminality through notions of settler ter territoriality tied to citizenship and its dispossession is an underexamined area in U.S. and Can Canadian Indigenous studies, I feel, except for a few people. Um, though many examine California and California Indian politics are looking at legislative criminality and carcerality and are beginning to look at this more fully, extending Luana Ross's foundational work in 1980, 1998 work on inventing the savage. Work by scholars such as Brenda Nichols and Flori Sochi are examining mass migration of Latin American, indigenous Latin American citizens resulting from forms of dispossession in which the severing of lands has led to the movement and migration 
as well. Yet the role of citizenship in this movement is often then relegated to Mexican and again subsumes the indigenous within that. Um, but I wanted to bring up the work of those important young scholars who are looking at this legislative criminality in terms of migration at the southern border, though I'm talking about the, the northern border, because it is such a prominent issue today. And Shannon Speed very rightly talks about this legislative criminality as forms of dehumanizing as well and severing those relations between between um, spaces and place is, is part of where I will probably extend this paper. So Carius Salmon here is an enactment of indigenous relationalities or what indigenous feminist scholars refer to as radical relationalities. These slivers of radical relationality are a continuum that precedes and indeed supersedes the ICA uh, and ever more promising in a continuation of ancestral knowledge. Becoming citizens of the settler state did not come with the mythic qualities of equality and freedom, but rather with the force of silencing assimilation into a legal order that had already criminalized and placed them outside the state. So here in this picture, you also have Norman Aker's wonderful work where he looks at the stag as also that breaking the boundaries of the landscape. He, he um, does this wonderful series of photo where he superimposes from Kansas all the way down to Oklahoma to reclaim Osage territory through these wonderful depictions, very colorful, vibrant, prominent features of the stag whose you know, horns are wrapped up within the Cartesian map that we see here as well. So next one. So in indoctrination number three by Stephen Dio, he superimposes the definition of equality. Citizenship is supposed to bring us equality, right? In indoctrination, he superimposes this definition over an historical boarding school photo from the era when American Indians were to be made equal under the auspices of American legal doctrine as citizens. The superimposition of equality as a dictionary entry emphasizes the power of the English language and legality as a cage. The red line across the mouths of the pupils speaks to not only a loss of language, and here we can think of the mother tongue and citizenship, which has been part of that political formations of how citizenship gets conceived, but also that of what would be citizenship rights under the law. The words color coded in red entrap the students. As I am sure many will address here today from an archival, legal, historical perspective, there are many approaches to what citizenship might mean for indigenous peoples and their continuation as nations, confederacies, and indeed families or indeed children, right? This is life and death matters here. Will being U.S. citizens under American or Canadian law bring us more protection from settlers? Or will the welcoming of foreign governments, such as the Canada and U.S., render our lands as property to be subsumed individually and our bodies as deviant citizens? There is no easy answer to these questions of citizenship for Indigenous nations and the devouring machine of colonialism and racialization and the making of the modern settler state continued or indeed continues unabated post 1924. I'm not going to do the history. I'll leave that for many people in this room with that. So if we think of citizenship as next one. If we think of citizenship as a form of care, which the responsibility of the state or governance is supposed to create a level of protection or care of the citizenry, and then in turn, we respectively have accountability to it. We need to be reminded of the link between care in uh, care between slavery and colonialism, right? There's a link there. As Sandy Grande states, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring her into this room, genocide and slavery set the conditions for who was perceived and constructed as legitimate subjects of care. So it's not just that it's a deviant, legally legislated criminalization of Indians as citizens. It's also who becomes the legitimate subjects of care under these concepts of citizenship. So like the salmon jumping, the imaginary, next one, imaginary borders at Niagara Falls, again, I to return to Norman Akers, exhorts a mobile relations of care. 
what is, as Michelle Daigle states, a geographer whose work I deeply love, an indigenous methodologies that stem from relations of care that can be strategically mobilized to build a myriad of relationships or relational processes rather than territorial ones that sustain our communities that are foundational to indigenous futurity. As I have said elsewhere, I'm not saying, just for the lawyers here, let me make it clear, I am not saying we abandon the sovereignty of territory. What I am saying is we have to move above and beyond that. We always had people who were runners. We always had people at the edge of the woods. We've always had people that extended that indigenous mobility. Indigenous mobility does not have to mean abandoning of territorial sovereignty. So I want to make that clear. So upon viewing Aker's work, I ask, how is the sea to shine in she, sea, effective regime of settler belonging disrupted by the visual impact of indigenous artists. The use of the stag in the pictures and important iconography within Osage and the acorns form a sustenance is key to acres unsettling of the terrains and mobile relations of care that are quote, rooted through indigenous people's movement. And this movement politic is learned from the non-human world often. So we see an artist reformulating these ideas of care and indigenous mobility and sovereignty is the use of animals within their artwork or um, in, in staging. I'll get to this in a second. The stag moves through the boundary of the map across state and highways. The thin lines of the map pale in comparison to the depth of the stag represented. Throughout many representations of land and treaties, we see the non-human represented again and again to assert the fact of natural movements across territories that US legislation attempts to define and limit. Acres continually employs the stags, the Cartesian map, and other iconographic, iconographic mm, Osage designs to reclaim territory and assert a belonging to land that is not just limited to the reduced territories of that sovereign area. Chamorro feminist, I know I'm going all the way to the other side of Pacific now, emphasizes a practice and her call to, to attention to tomorrow's as an interactive process of belonging. And that's what I'd like us to think about in terms of citizenship and indigenous futurities, that interactive process of belonging that's in relationship with Pano, which is land in tomorrow, and Tasi, which is water. I've read a lot of uh, Chamorro dissertations lately. So uh, that can be those contests that always contests the militarized narratives of totalized power in Guam. So it's this contestation of totalized power that we see in creating different forms of citizenship around relationality. So like the flying head of Nero, there's a refusal to be contained or limited by settler citizenship, which fails to live up to its promise with its focus on how a present now individual and rather a return to thinking of ancestral markings of territory and radical relationality that accounts for generational responsibilities. So failed promises is where I get to, but back to the thinking in Indian exhibit and this particular work by Eric Gainsworth, who's Tuscarora, who does a rendition of a wampum belt here. Um, it's not our traditional, doesn't have our traditional treaty iconography, which in some ways I see as a forceful reminder, just give us some truth. <laughs> so, because maybe they didn't understand what the two row meant. So playing with the failed promises of treaty making that should have honored its ongoing obligation, Gainsworth sar sarcastically states with the wampum, give me truth. This upsets what Rifkin in 2009 I forget, I don't put the title of the book there, but claims is the US government's mythologizing of itself as a nation based on choice and consent on its citizenry, rather than conquest and violent dispossession. Here, Gainsworth reminds us it's lies and violent dispossession that these treaties were based on, well, the Citizenship Act was based on. The ICA was an alternative to outright military might in many ways, but both led to the incorporate corporation of land into a, a property regime of liberal democracy. In this regime, the individual citizenship is emphasized and as such claims to land holdings are also individualized. Citizenship has been described as a bounded concept within, geographic, within geography, that is membership in a formally recognized politically boundaries and a membership that holds together a citizenry through uh, social norms. Indigenous studies and indeed artists 
offer us a contestation and a particular insight into the dilemma of settler citizenship, always anxious in its assertion of a natural boundary making through its political control, like we're supposed to accept that natural boundary of Canada and the US or mix it, right? Thus, Carrier's positioning of the salmon as a non-human relative is also strengthened by the assertion of the political governance of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy that inframes that relation and ongoing obligations set forth in the Gnocchio, or our original instructions that deem our citizenship as one of accountability in relationality to land. The original instructions precede that citizenry. To be in good relations means learning to live in relation to other people, non-human life forms in a profoundly non-authoritative, authoritative, authoritative non-dominating, non-exploitive manner. And here I'm quoting uh, Glenn Coulthard. Accountability and reciprocity move us beyond a singular identity and do not limit us to space that is defined by the settler state. How might art practices create not only a sense of belonging, but also a sense of reciprocity and responsibility? In Red Pedagogy, Sandy Grande asked us to create a space for, quote, a decolonial imaginary to work in solidarity, to envision a way of life free of exploitation and replete with spirit, proceeding on our journey to learn, to teach, to be, again, back to the Gnocchio, to recognize this space from the embodied position to the body politic of the nation differs greatly from forms of settler citizenship that that are the settler forms of citizenship that are not inclusive, reflexive, and not in relation to the non-human, nor is it a position of solidarity, but rather they are notions of citizenship laid out in the Indian Citizenship Act are largely about holding and amassing property. This has been the case from the start of how citizenship was considered in relation to property subjects and humans. The enumeration in the census did not ask about nation state origins, but about land holdings, who was a property land holding. The enumeration in the consensus, in the census, there was no consensus in the census, in the census, did not ask about nation state origins, but about those on film. In fact, next one, I'm never gonna get to the end of this, here we go, <laughs> was uh, to extract land from indigenous control, both at the level of the body, such as relegating land ownership through blood quantum or gendering in particular ways allotment how educated one was often determined the ownership. There are many allotment stories, to use a phrase of the same edited wonderful volume I encourage you all to read by Jeannie O'Brien, Daniel Heath Justice, we get to hear from. And many of these stories about land allotment converge with various scales of citizenship, where one found themselves in relation to the nation of their own community, relation to the nation of the nation, or relation to the nation of the territories that they find themselves in. So contemporary artists that we see here, such as Erica Lord, note this very deeply in the work. On one hand, we have on one arm, which is dissected into various pieces as though you can dissect the body, we have blood quantum, and on the other, enrollment numbers. So we see this kind of embodied forms of citizenship that I also hope will be taken up by many of you and addressed further. Lord describes the complication as such in regards to her work's inspiration. She says, quote, the idea of home becomes complicated and this is reflected in my work. I have formed multiple homes through this, this diaspora, each of them holding uh, significance and meaning to me. Yeah. This repetition of displacement, making homes, leaving and returning home cyclically leads to a feeling of leading several lives. The idea of oneself begins to divide into multiple perspectives, such as we saw in the arms outstretched. The qualities that, de that tend to define my identity create an overlapping and blurring of borders. The multiplicity of cells become indivisible, not split or partial, not singular, but a flexible amalgamation of many. Mixed experience differ with each generation, the description of one split between two worlds is a simplification of an idea that is much larger and complex. So the relationship then between contemporary art and indigenous self-determination is an anti-colonial anecdote of the dissolution of dissolution through settler policy, particularly in the afterlife of the ICA. 
Next slide. These artists provide a possibility, quote, possibility of the impossible as Fanon um, renders to us. And here I put this in because what we see a lot through these artwork and what we saw in the last stage was this first line, as soon as I desire, I am asked to be considered. So what we see in that artwork is we see that kind of play with that desire and we see a kind of turning back in the way an Indian brain offer and a turning back from just being um, resistance, but a turning inwards as Joe John Mohawk um, would advocate to our communities and to our, um, our place in the world in terms of our own citizenship or membership or forms of belonging that we have within our communities. So Casey Adams' wonderful series here, juxtapose, uh, next juxtaposes the worst that has been said about indigenous peoples, combining the stereotypes of sub citizenry with that of creating a subhuman. And I had a whole section, a couple pages on winters, et cetera, that will be, you know, come later. She reclaims this uh, in her artwork with humor and a plume in her Indian glamour shots. I have no better way to describe them. They're beautiful. <laughs> Symbols of desire and refusal exist here to take the settler categorization and turn it on its head. So what we have here, you can see the, the things that get said, they, everybody pick their own quotes. I actually had a wonderful time in Ottawa many years ago now, it's almost 20 years ago with Audra. Um, and uh, so the, 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 the white is in the background and we see this just kind of prominent displacement, almost like a bunch of Indian angels with these really awful things on their shirt that's in the background, right? I, I just love this. So, as I said, I did not get to land back. And for this, I hope it becomes a discussion throughout our time here. But I provide these images to remind us of the geographic relationships between citizenry and place, the ground of enactments of belongings that many artists upend through thinking of a radical relationality. This radical relationality is envisioned as ancestral knowledge seen here in the director of National Museum. Next one. Oh, I forgot one. That's a beautiful shot. I couldn't help it. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. This radical relationality is envisioned as ancestral knowledge seen here in the director of the National Museum in uh, Iroquois Na National Museum in Salamanca. Hayden Haynes's incredible um, piece. He titles A Message from the Ancestors, but in our um, Haudenosaunee archive research portal of which many of these images are found. Um, we've been calling it the land back, Nicholas. So I leave that there for you to take a look at. It is here as well as those, um, it is in the artwork and the radically relationality envisioned in our artists that the, even those that are not federally recognized is that we begin to see and define an accountability to community, land, and the more than human. Next one, please. And so with that, I will leave this all open to discussion and just in here, and we can, we can talk about what any of these pieces might mean or could mean as, um, as well, and I'm happy to chat more. So thank you.